So good afternoon. I'm really happy and honored to be here with you. And uh, I really wish to thank Professor Onda for inviting me at this uh, workshop and at the meeting that we had yesterday. And so thank you very, very much. It is a great opportunity for me to share our experiences with, uh, with your institute. Uh, during this presentation, I would like to, to give you some information about the activity that we do in our laboratory. And the main contents of uh, my presentation will be a short presentation of my agency and uh, what, uh, why we have to measure radioactivity in our environment, which are the main sources of radioactivity. What we do to detect radioactivity in the environment also in emergency situation within the context of national and European environmental radioactivity network. And then I go on with some more detail about water monitoring, drinking and surface water monitoring and uh, about what, uh, what we do to, uh, let's say, to evaluate the results of our measurements. So what we do to, to understand if what we measure is good or not from the point of view of those and of health. Um, so my agency, Arpa Lombardia, Arpa is a government agency we are not a university, we are not a research institute, but we, have, we are a government agency in charge of preventing and monitoring every kind of environmental pollution due both to chemical and to radioactive material. There are 21 agencies like my agency in, in Italy, one for each region of Italy. And we are located in the north, we are Arpa Lombardia, um, and all of our agencies are coordinated at the national level by ISPRA, which is set in Rome. Lombardia is the region north, the main town of Lombardia is Milano, and our region is actually the biggest in Italy, even if uh, smaller than Tokyo. <laughs> so. The situation is quite different. We have 13 offices in the main towns of the region and uh, we employ about 1,000 people, all of them technicians, chemists, physicists, biologists and so on. The headquarters is in Milano. And as I told you, we are mainly involved in the um, monitoring of the environment from different kinds of pollutants. They can be chemical, they can be radioactive materials, noise, uh, electromagnetic field, and so on. But we also, uh, and, and so and we measure air, wastewater, surface water, and this is part of the monitoring activity. But we also go inside uh, productive activities, factories, and so on, to check what they do to keep uh, the environment safe, preventing the production and the emission in the environment of waste, of contaminated air and water. We do all this activity of monitoring and control also for radioactive material. And for the radiation protection sector, we, we look uh, for artificial radioactivity as well as we look for natural radioactivity. In our radiation protection center we are 10 people, chemists, biologists and physicists. We have two measurement labs and one radiochemistry lab for the measurement of uh, alpha and beta emitters like strontium-90, plutonium isotopes, uh, uranium and so on. The laboratories are accredited uh, under the ISO International Standard 17025 and we have different 
equipment for uh, uh, different kinds of measurements in field and in laboratory. And we also have uh, tools uh, specific for that evaluation and risk assessment. We will talk a bit about this topic at the end of the presentation. As we have already said, that our center is a member of the national network for environmental radioactivity monitoring, which is part of the European network. We are a member of the IAA Almera network, and in this context, we had the opportunity to meet Professor Honda and your colleagues last year in Vienna. And we work with our uh, regional and national health authorities uh, as uh, scientific advisors. And we are members of ISA committees for the production of standards for the measurement of radioactivity in water. Why we do have uh, to look for radioactivity in our region, this is our region, uh, Lombardia. As you see, in the north part we have mountains, and the south part is almost flat. So actually in Italy we have no more nuclear power plants. We had about 10, but uh, all of them were shut down in 1986. So all of them are under the commissioning. All the fuel or the uranium has been removed. So what we have for a nuclear power plant is just the building the contaminated area of the building which is still under the commissioning. But we also have a few waste repositories that must be controlled and uh, as artificial sources of radioactivity in the environment now we mainly have still the consequences of the Chernobyl accident which is very severe in our region because during the accident, during the days of the accident when the clouds arrived in Europe and in Italy, it was rainy, mainly in the north part of our region and the rain uh, brought down a lot of radioactivity. That's why also today these measurements were made last year, sample taken last year, we still have high levels of radioactivity, for example, in mushrooms from wild forest, which uh, in some part the, the, on the x-axis you have the name of different areas of our region. In some part of our region, namely this one, which is at the north, where the fallout was worst, we can still have levels of cesium which exceed the maximum permitted level of 600 becquerel per kilo according to the European uh, um, legislation. As other sources of radioactivity in our environment, we have the radioactivity due to the medical use of radioactive material, as well as this one, this is a big problem, because sometimes it happens that people are uh, hidden radioactive sources in a metal scrap and uh, this metal scrap is uh, usually sent to a foundry or to a factory that produces steel to be melted and to produce uh, new steel for example and if a radioactive source is hidden inside the scrap the, the plant actually melts the sources and this produces a big contamination both of the plant and of the waste material produced by the plant. And so we still have some cases of these species that which are not really easy to be, to be managed with. And we do have to keep monitoring of the environment around these places. The last slide, we also have natural radioactivity, as I told you. And uh, the main problem is with water. We will talk about the radioactivity in water later. But we also have the highest level of radon in air in, uh, uh, all over Italy. This value is quite high. The radon comes from the soil in our region, which is quite rich in uh, radioactivity. And that level, when compared to the world average, 
is pretty high and it is in our region the second cause of lung cancer um, after the smoking. Mm. And we also dis do this kind of measurement. Within the context of the environmental monitoring, we have a, a particular device, a particular attention to the monitoring of the radioactivity in air. Because uh, to look for radioactivity in the air is the best way to, to detect, uh, for the early detection of a nuclear accident, of, of a contamination of the environment due to an accident. To this extent, uh, we have a system that is, works continuously and with which we, we collect both particulate and gas. For particulate, the system is a system like this. It's a system that uh, collects about 100 cubic meter per hour of air. And uh, the particulate is trapped uh, by a filter, a glass microfiber filter. And then it is measured, it is measured daily. And then the daily samples are collected and measured again on composite samples, weekly and monthly. This is a short presentation of the results of the mm, measurement on monthly sample. So, during the Chernobyl accident, all this cesium is from Chernobyl, okay? During the Chernobyl accident, the level of cesium in air was about 10, 10 becquerel per cubic meter. We started with the regular monitoring of the air about two years later, in 1988, and the levels of cesium had already decreased a lot, but yet we were able to measure it. You see, we always had peaks during winter season, because in winter, the, the weather is more stable, is steady. We are in a flat area, there is no wind. So during the, the winter, we usually have worst condition for the accumulation of every kind of contaminant which comes from the soil. And all of the cesium that we see is just a resuspension of the Chernobyl cesium. Also, we saw this peak in 1998. And it was due, we were the first to detect it in Europe, and it was due to the melting of another radioactive source in the south of Spain, in a foundry. They, they didn't know they had a cesium source hidden inside the metal scrap, and they melted it. And also we saw small traces of the Fukushima accident. This is for particulate. But together, oh sorry, this last slide is just curious because a few months ago we also were able to detect in air very, very small amounts, this one, you see, for a few days, of ruthenium-106. Ruthenium-106 is a very strange nuclide that usually comes from the fission of uranium. And when you have a nuclear accident, as a Chernobyl accident, usually you can see ruthenium in the environment, but it is ruthenium together with other nuclides. Usually you see iodine, cesium, ruthenium, and so on. This, this case was quite strange because we saw only ruthenium, nothing else. And uh, with some simulation and uh, uh, with the information provided by other European labs, we were able to understand that these small amounts of ruthenium came from somewhere here in the east of Europe. So nobody, so far, nobody said that that was me who put the ruthenium in here. But according to all the simulation, it seems uh, 
that the most probable area of origin of the ruthenium was somewhere in the south of Russia. So the, the, the concentrations, the amount of radioactivity that we measured in Europe was so low that it was of no concern from the point of view of the health. But for sure, in the point where the contamination, the initial contamination occurred, we see that there has been a big accident with probably big consequences on the environment and on people. This is for particulate. As I told you, we also have a specific system to trap the gas because we also have some radionuclide which actually don't, don't get attached to particulate but they are gas and namely this is the case for iodine 131. So when we sample particulate with this white filter which is the glass fiber filter we put under the filter a box, a plastic box which is filled with a material which is a carbon, a charcoal, which is specific for absorption of different chemical species of iodine. And so with this, uh, we, we leave this, uh, this um, sampler in place for one week and then we measure it. And with this device, uh, we were, for example, able to measure at the time of the Fukushima accident uh, that uh, the amount, uh, the total amount of radioactivity of iodine-131 in, in Milano was due in part to the particulate, uh, about 20% of the total. But the higher part of iodine that arrived in Italy was still in a gaseous form. It was about 80% of the total amount of iodine that we were able to measure. All of these data are sent to our national institute that in turn sends the data to the European institute that collects the data for the environmental monitoring. Um, the monitoring is uh, done according to two main legislation, which is uh, this European recommendation for general environment monitoring and this directive, which is specific for drinking water. And the monitoring is carried out or on the general environment, selected some points where, for example, we measure hair where many people live or we collect milk that many people eat and we also have a source related monitoring around for example specific waste repositories of radioactive material according to the european commission what we have to measure mainly are air surface and drinking water, milk, which is the main component of our diet and in which radionuclides can easily migrate from one step to the other, and then the main component of our diet. We mainly look for strontium-90 as a consequence of the fallout due to the testing of the nuclear weapons in the 60s, we still see strontium-90 due to the nuclear testing, and cesium-137, mainly due to Chernobyl. And also the commission specifies which are the required detection limit for the different radio clients. We measure about 1,000 samples per year, half of them food and half from the environment, air, soil, water, and so on. Um, many of the samples are from water, drinking and surface water. And at the very end of, uh, at the end of every year, we take all the data of food contamination, of air contamination all together, and we do, we calculate the dose which is due 
to the radioactivity, the artificial radionuclidity in the in our environment in that year. And actually, you see that it is a very very small number, just. 0.003 millisievert per year, which is really nothing when compared to the dose uh, of natural radioactivity that we have every year, which is more than 2.4 millisievert per year, and which is mainly due to radon, which is actually the main concern, the main source of exposure of our population. Uh, going deeply in the, the topic of uh, water monitoring, so we monitor drinking and surface water. For what concerns drinking water, we have a specific directive. We must follow the European Directive 51. And so we have to uh, do monitoring of major ground and surface water supplies and water distribution network. In our region, almost all of the water is, uh, that we drink is groundwater, not surface water. And as groundwater, it can be really rich in natural radionuclide. And actually, we should measure radon to chewing water, Tritium only if there is a source of artificial tritium in the environment. We do not have this kind of sources, and so we do not measure tritium. And then according to the directive, we should uh, theoretically measure all the radionuclides, both artificial and natural, which are present in water in order to check compliance with this dose limit of 0.1 millisievert per year due to water consumption. And as it is not possible to measure everything, according to directive, we can use as screening parameters gross alpha and gross beta activities. That means the measurement of all alpha particles and the measurement of all beta particles or beta meters which are present in the water. If these activities are lower than 0.1 and 1 becker per liter, we can assume that the water is safe. If not, we have to go on and to measure the single nuclides. Okay? For example, uranium, which is the main source of radioactivity in our waters, radium, cesium, and so on. The directive also specifies the values for the limit of detection, and this is very helpful because it gives advice on the selection of the best, the, the most proper measuring method. Um, so, actually, what we do with drinking water is that we do an extensive monitoring of gross alpha and gross beta activity. And we do it with a, um, an instrument, I don't know if you know it, which is called liquid scintillation counter, which is this one. And you take the water, you have a, a simple concentration by evaporation, and then you mix the water with a liquid scintillation cocktail, which actually is the detector. You mix the water with the detector, you have in this way a very good efficiency for the measurement of alpha and beta particles. And then you put the, this vial, which contains the water and the liquid detector, inside your instruments. The radioactive particles emitted by the water interact with the detector and they produce small, uh, small, very, very small amounts of light. And this light is collected and measured inside the liquid simulation counter. It is a very, very effective technique for the measuring of alpha and beta particles, which otherwise are not so easy to measure and require complicated radiochemistry. Okay. The results, uh, just very, very quickly, I'm oh, sorry. The results were, we always have gross alpha activity, 
our water and reach actually in uranium isotopes. We do not have data in terms in our water, and we never, never detect artificial radionuclide in our water. In few cases, we also have a more specific. Uh, uh, I go back uh, one slide here. A more specific method for gamma emitters, which is based uh, on the continuous solution of about uh, 200 liter of tap water during one month <coughs> on a column uh, of raising. This device is set in our laboratory. It uh, uh, works continuously over one month. And the water goes very, very slowly through the raising. And at the end of the month, we can measure it. And as you see, in few cases, when needed, we can achieve much lower level of sensitivity for the monitoring of CDU-137. For what, concern, what we do instead with surface water? Well, with surface water, also in this case, uh, we, um, the monitoring that we do is according to the requirements of the European recommendation. And we have uh, different sampling points all over Italy. And in uh, our region, in Lombardia, we have uh, eight, uh, seven in a river and one in a lake. Okay. What we, we had to look again for beta activity and cesium-137. The required limit of detection is quite high, one beta per liter. So we can measure surface water just by direct sampling and measurement by gamma spectrometry, we don't need to concentrate it, okay? In few cases, we do the radiochemistry because our national regulation, we have a national regulation that also requires the measurement of gross beta, plutonium isotopes, and strontium ionity in water. Uh, this is an example of the results that we get. This is a sampling point uh, in uh, one of our lake. Dervio is the name of the place. We sample two times per year, in spring and in autumn, because in different period of the year, we have uh, different depth of the vertical mixing layer of the water in the lake. And so we could have different concentration of the radionuclide which actually is not the case because as you see, autumn and spring we have all, always almost the same value. We can see just gross half activity, again uranium, all the other parameters are always lower than the limit of detection of our system. Um, if better li li limit of detection is required, we can also concentrate the sample. And we can concentrate the sample, for example, 5 liters, into different methods, or by absorption on ion exchange raising, or by sample evaporation. This, which follow, is a short uh, explanation of the absorption on ion exchange raising. It is really nothing new or special. It is just a specific uh, resin for iron and cation. And uh, in about two or three days, it is not very quick, uh, actually. It is not very fast. In about two or three days, we can concentrate about uh, five liters of water. Another method that we use is a sample evaporation. Also, in this case, it is, not, it is nothing special, but uh, the fact that uh, the fact that we had some inert material when we had the water, for example, five liters, and then we put inside the water about a few grams of this inert material, which is uh, this uh, silica, and then uh, we put the sample over uh, a hot plate, 
and we bring the sample to evaporation. We evaporate to dryness. The advantage of this uh, method is that uh, it is not dependent on the amount of the stone sold, uh, sorts uh, that could be a problem. For example, when you use uh, uh, resin, because resin could uh, get saturated if you have too many salts. And uh, the other advantage is that once it is dried, it is still dusty. You don't have a crusty scales at the bottom of your container. And so it's very easy to take the residue and to transfer the residue from the baker after the evaporation into the measurement counter. And also it is, uh, it is actually very, very, very cheap. It is not quick at all. It takes a lot of time. So if you have time and don't have money, it works very, very well. <laughs> And again, this is an example of the limit of detection that you can achieve actually with gamma spectrometry. What makes the difference in the limit of detection is mainly the amount of sample that you have and that you concentrate. If you concentrate a huge volume of uh, water, the limit of detection uh, immediately increases. Uh, we had the opportunity to compare the results of these different methods thanks to a uh, in proficiency testing occurred of last year. And the proficiency testing was organized by the International Atomic Energy Agency thanks to the cooperation of your institution and of Professor Honda who provided uh, water from uh, a Japanese river which uh, were uh, contaminated by cesium-137 and 134. And this was uh, a very, very great opportunity to test uh, the different measurement methods on real sample because we know that when we, uh, when we use, uh, um, let's say, sample as this quality control sample that was provided by the IAEA, and it was a sample which was artificially spiked with the cesium, radioactive cesium. The problem with the spiked sample is that uh, they don't behave as true as a real sample. And so what is always better if you want to compare different methods and to check which is the best for your measurement, it's actually to use the real samples taken from the real world, as was the case with this uh, Japan River sample. In our cases, in our experience, the methods uh, that work the better with the, through the real sample was this one with evaporation. Actually, we had some problem with the resin absorption, and other labs also had, had some problem with this kind of uh, method. Uh, probably because of the choice, the specific resin that uh, had been chosen for the, for the extraction of the season, that maybe in this case it was not the, the best one. And similar results with another sample of water from the native. Hmm? Um, when we, when we um, uh, go to, when we do the monitoring of uh, surface water, actually we also control, measure the level of radioactivity in fish and in uh, suspended particles in the, in the river flow. So actually we measure fish because uh, on, we, we, eat, we eat fish, it is a food, but it is also a good marker of the environment contamination. And this is an example of different kind of fish and we start uh, sampling soon after the general accident and we had values up to 1,000 becquerel per kilo or season 137 and our limit value is 600 and at the very beginning 
all the dis different species of fish gave similar results. But these fish actually are different kinds of fish from the smaller, which is this one, to the bigger. This, this fish is herbivorous, this one is carnivorous. So what we saw quickly is that the smaller fish, this one, has a lower sedium concentration, while the sedium concentration is higher in this case for the well-known phenomenon which is known as bioaccumulation of cesium along the food chain. And also another interesting result is this one that we had in two different lakes. In this case, we have the same kind of fish. The fish is always this uh, Perca fluviatilis, okay? But it was sampled in two different lakes, uh, which are this one. One is Lario, and the other is Ceresio. At the very beginning, the concentration were similar, they were the same. But soon after, in one of the two lakes, this one, we had lower value. And the reason is that this lake, which is Lario, has a lower retention time of the water inside the basin, which means that in this case, it takes only about four years for a full change of the water inside the lake, while in this case, it takes more time. So in this case, we have a quicker cleaning of the contaminated water, and that's why we also see in fish lower values of concentration in this case compared with this one. So we also do another kind of monitoring of surface water which is based on the monitoring of suspended particles. And I, to describe this method, which is a very easy and cheap method, I also have a video and the video is much easier to understand than the explanation, which is not really very, very, very clear. So if it's fine for you, we can go on, and I will show you the results of this monitoring of suspended, parti suspended particles. At the end of the presentation, okay, we can look at the video. Okay, is it fine for you? Okay. So this is the description of the method, and actually, again, we see uh, these are the results that we get uh, for the contamination by CDM137 in different rivers okay, of our region. And actually, we have higher CDM concentration in this river, which is the Lambro, which is this one, which is a river south of Lombardia, but which collects waters from the north part of the region, where we had higher cesium for love to do to Chernobyl. That's why here cesium content is still higher. In this case, we have a comparison of results, the same river due to cesium and iodine-131, because we can also see iodine-131 in our river due to the medical use of radioactive iodine in therapy and in diagnostic uh, analysis. Mm, this method, this, uh, the, the analysis of suspended particle, proved to be especially valuable some years ago when uh, thanks to this method we were able to detect an accident that occurred here. This is a, a river, okay, below here we have a river. And then sometime during the ordinary uh, monitoring on suspended particles that was carried out here, because here we had a nuclear power plant, they detected uh, 
higher amounts, uh, much higher amounts of cesium-137 in suspended particles. And the origin was unknown. And to try to understand what, what had happened, they went through along the river, okay, along the different rivers that uh, departed from this point. And at the very end, they found increasing, always increasing value values of cesium-137 in the suspended particle and at the very end they arrived here where a foundry had contaminated a, a huge cesium-137 uh, source and this foundry was set uh, very very close to a small river and used to put uh, to, to, um, um, to send uh, uh, the wastewater into this small river. The wastewater was heavily contaminated by cesium-137 and at the very end this heavy contamination arrived in this bigger river. And we would have never detected uh, this, this accident without this kind of monitoring. We have almost finished. So the last part of the presentation concerns the how, what, what we do with the activity values that we get. We make a measurement and then what, what do we do with the numbers? And also we do that we must, for example, look for radioactivity in surface water, but which is the desirable limit of detection? Which method should we use? Usually these are the steps that we follow to decide what to do and how to do. Uh, we have to define a link between the amount of radioactivity in water and the final dose, the dose to, 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 to men, because this is the final goal of every measurement of radioactivity. And this is what we say, we have to define the exposure scenario, when we will see free example. Then we have to define which is the dose, the target dose. Uh, let's say I want to be sure that if I drink this water, the dose that I get will be less than a well-defined value. And then we define the relationship between dose and the concentration of radioactivity in water. We calculate the, the value of this concentration which corresponds to the target dose. And then we can decide to assume a detection limit, a fraction of the dose, and then we select the measurement method. So if it is confused now, I will try to explain better with a few examples. The first example is the easiest because it is for drinking water. In this case, we do have a target dose, which is set by the European Directive. The water can be contaminated, but the dose due to the consumption of water must be less than 0.1 millisievert per year. The dose is due to the radioactivity which is inside the water and the relationship between dose and the radioactivity in water is given by this formula. So we have that the dose is uh, uh, calculated by multiplying the concentration of radioactivity, in this case in water, multiplied by the amount of water that we assume per year, multiplied by the ingestion coefficient for the specific region of light as defined by the scientific literature. So if this is the formula follows that the concentration is given by this other very, very simple formula. And if we put here 
the numbers for the consumption of water, for example, for adults, usually we assume this amount of water per year, drug per year. And for season 137 and for adults, uh, ingestion coefficient given by the scientific literature in this one, if we put this number here, we have uh, that the concentration of cesium-137, which corresponds to a dose of 0.1 millisievert per year, is given by 10.5 becquerel per kilo. Then when we do the measurement, we can decide that we want to measure, this, this is a general assumption, of one-tenth of this value, and so we, we should be able, we should select a measurement um, technique that allows that has a limit of detection of one becquerel per kilo. So one becquerel per kilo or less would, be, would, would already be a good measurement technique. So for example, for drinking water, this limit of detection for cesium can be easily achieved by direct gamma spectrometry on one liter of water. It would be enough. Okay. The second example is, uh, well, uh, let's assume that now we have to measure surface water, okay? And then we are concerned uh, um, for the possible contamination of surface water because in this water, there is fish and we eat the fish. And if the water is contaminated, the fish is contaminated as well. So how can we have a, a, an idea more or less of the concentration of radioactivity in water that is not, is not good? We have to look for. So in this case, let's assume, for example, that the target dose is one millisievert per year, just to make an example which is the general limit for the general population. Again, the relationship between dose and concentration of radioactivity in fish is this one, we eat the fish, we are exposed to radioactivity in surface water because we eat the fish that lives in this water. And if, as we, we have already done, if, if, if we put here the number for our target dose of one millisievert per year and the um, fish consumption rate that in Italy it is 16 kilo per year, it is much higher here. And the um, dose coefficient for ingestion for cesium, if we put the number, we have that uh, the cesium concentration in fish corresponding to one millisievert per year in fish is about uh, 4,800 becquerel per kilo. Okay, so this is the relationship between those and cesium in fish. What about the relationship between cesium in fish and cesium in water? Because at the very end we want to measure the water. So we can assume, we can use this very general formula a very, very, very simplified formula, which is taken from uh, different scientific technical records, which links the concentration in fish to the concentration in water, thanks to the use of this factor, which is called the accumulation factor, which is a factor which gives the amount, uh, the relationship between uh, the concentration in fish in becquerel per kilo with respect to the concentration of cesium in, in water. This is an experimental value that can assume very, very different values and also in the scientific literature, for example, you found uh, values from 30 to 1, uh, sorry, 10,000, which is really a, a huge range. And for sure, I, I think that the research that you will be through, you have already carried out uh, thanks to the availability of many experimental data after the Fukushima accident. I'm sure that they added more knowledge about this, uh, the, the value of these factors. 
But actually, in this case, uh, if, uh, so we, we take this value from the literature, and we take the worst case of the highest bioaccumulation factor, we have that in water, in water, the concentration in water that would give rise uh, to that concentration in fish is about 0.5 becalacterite, okay? So we should look for water with 0.5 becalacterite of sedium <coughs> that would give rise in the worst case to that concentration in fish. And uh, the desired detection limit could be one-tenth of that value. That is uh, 0 0.05 decal per kilo. In this case, direct measurement uh, is absolutely not good because the limit of detection is too high. We have to concentrate somehow the water to some extent. The very last example is uh, from uh, waste uh, water from waste repository. And this is a, 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 real, a real case that we had in our region where we had this repository which was filled with the foundry's leg and it was meant for ordinary foundry's leg but after being filled, it came out that this leg was contaminated by cesium-137. And the repository, this one, is in the middle of an agricultural area. And uh, when, uh, when it rains, the rain goes through the material which has been put into the, 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 sorry, the deposit. And uh, there is some waste water which uh, comes out from the bottom of the deposit. Uh, and this waste water is heavily contaminated by cesium-137. So th the matter is, which is the destiny of this waste water which is contaminated? Um, and and uh, which is uh, the... Uh, the, the, uh, what, what should we look for? Uh, sorry, one, one step uh, ahead. Uh, around the, so around this uh, the, uh, repository, we put uh, a specific monitoring plan and we went to measure water from this well, which is from, for drinking people and animals live here. Also, we um, measure this wastewater that comes out uh, from the bottom of the repository and there is also a small pond here, okay? For what concerns the well that provides drinking water, we use the, the same assumptions that we have already seen for drinking water, okay? We just were also a bit more calculative and so we lower the, the desired the target dose from 0.1 to 10 microsievert per year. And so in this case, we went to look for smaller concentration of cesium in drinking water when compared to the previous example. But th this is easy and we have already seen it. For uh, the wastewater, we had to, th this was the more complicated uh, case because we had to define the exposure scenario. And in this case, what happened is that waste was collected by tanks. And then it was sent for waste processing to an ordinary sewage, which collects the urban wastewater from the, from the city. And then the sludge, which actually concentrates all the cesium, is used in agriculture. And so it was, it, this was a, a great concern of what, uh, which dose could come out from the use of this contaminated sludge in agriculture. So very easily, this is a simplified picture of what we did to understand which was uh, we, how, how big was the problem? 
And so we had this contaminated wastewater, about uh, 1,000 tons per year. And the average sitting concentration was 100 meter per kilo. So every year, we had a total amount of cesium in wastewater coming out from the waste repository of about 10, 10 megabecquerel per year. All of this cesium went to the sewage treatment plant. It was mixed with our dark wastewater. And at the very end, the cesium uh, was attached to the sludge because the cesium normally has this tendency to be absorbed on disturbed particles. So at the very end, we had clean water out from the plant and contaminated the large. All the cesium, we assume that all the cesium was here. And as we had this amount of cesium entering the plant, and as at the very end, per year, we had 2,000 tons of sludge coming out from the plant, we had that the average concentration of cesium in the sludge coming out from the plant was 500 per kilo. And then it was put to agricultural. And for agricultural use, actually, they, this is, a, um, they, what, what they do is they, they take the sludge and there is a limit uh, which is defined by our legislation in the amount of sludge that can be put uh, over every square meter of soil, which is 0 0.75 kilo of, of uh, sludge per square meter. And then this means that in terms of season 137, over each meter of soil, we will have about 400 becquerel per square meter of cesium. Well, when you do this calculation, you have somehow to uh, to make a solution and to simplify, because if you do not simplify, you don't get nothing. <laughs> so take a solution, simplify, and try to be conservative, okay? So from this value, then the sludge is mixed, because there is a mixing for uh, the agricultural use of the land within the first 10 centimeters of the soil. And so this initial concentration, assuming that it is mixed in the first 10 centimeters, and that this is the density of the soil, produces a final concentration of cesium in soil of 2.5 decarotter kilo. So at this point, what you have to do is to understand but this amount of cesium in soil, which dose gives to, for example, a person, a farmer, which lives over the contaminated soil, which has his house there, and which produces uh, vegetables and has animals living over the contaminated soil. To this extent, we use uh, this uh, model, which is uh, a model which is called the Resterad on site, developed by the U.S. Argo National Laboratory. It can be freely downloaded, and it is very useful because uh, give uh, very, very quickly the results for the, the dose due to the different exposure pathways that can be external irradiation due to the presence of contamination in the soil, as well as uh, internal <coughs> contamination of people due to the inhalation of resuspended uh, cesium, as well as the consumption of uh, contaminated food or uh, water, and so on. And the final result of this model, of this code, which is really very, very powerful, is that the dose uh, was um, about one microsiever per year, which is a very, very small amount, and that it was mainly due to external irradiation. So, uh, the, the final result in terms of dose, in this case, uh, 
would be that uh, the dose is really very, very, very low because it is lower than the value of 10 microsieverts per year, which is generally considered by the international safety standard as a trivial level of dose, a level of dose so low that it is of no concern. If we look at the same problem from another side, if, for example, we, we, we think that this number is still too high for us, or if this value if this is higher, of course this one is higher as well, then this code tells us that the main uh, way of exposure is the external irradiation. So if we need to lower the exposure of, of the population of people living here, what we have to do is to try to lower this way of exposure. It doesn't matter if they eat uh, the food produced here, because the food produced here is, is just a small amount uh, of, of uh, those. This is the, the, the real problem. And so we, we just the, the last slide. In this case, so uh, we, we saw that uh, we, we were able to define the relationship between the amount of radioactivity in the wastewater and the final dose. And those, uh, so in these cases, for example, if we want to be sure that our dose is kept below this value of 10 microsieverts per year, we should have. Uh, 1,000 becquerel per kilo of season 137, and following the same general rule that the required sensitivity could be 110, we would have the need of measure an amount of cesium which is 100 becquerel per kilo, which by gamma spectrometry is really uh, is a mountain, is, a, is a really a huge, a huge quantity. Okay, we have uh, almost finished. Uh, so here yeah, there is not, not, not really much more than we have already said. The choice of the method to be used for the measurement of cesium in water depends on the desired limit of detection. It can be fixed by law, and this is the most uh, the, uh, easy case, but when it is not fixed by law, then it is necessary to take into account the specific exposure scenario. And the specific exposure scenario can lead to very, very different requirements in terms of limit of detection. So this is really a key point. And actually, uh, when you uh, also, we have to say that uh, sometimes also the direct measurement of what we call uh, contamination markers as, for example, some kind of fish or suspended particles are really good and provide uh, reliable and useful data for the assessment of the general environment contamination. So we have finished with the presentation. I don't know if there is time for the video. We can look at it. Otherwise, we can skip. Uh, and thank you very much for your attention, first of all.